Can a poor country escape its place and past? Oof. Well, that's a tough question. Maybe it's better to start with a hypothetical. Hmm. Why shouldn't a, core, a poor country be able to escape its place or past? Wow. That's easy to answer. And here's why. It's called path dependence. In a nutshell, this refers to a situation in which anything you decide to do today is conditioned and constrained by choices, choices that you made in the past or which were made for you. Let's say, for example, on your 18th birthday, you decided to get really drunk with your buddies and at some point in the evening, someone says, hey, it's your birthday. Let's go smoke some meth and rob a gas station. So you say YOLO, which for science and most religions is a true statement, YOLO. And so you smoke some meth and you rob a gas station and naturally you, you get caught. This is what we call a critical juncture. A moment in time when a peculiar constellation of conditions and events uproots the current path of development that you're on and sends you reeling down a new path in which your future range of choice in life is now limited and dependent on that one pivotal moment when you decided to smoke meth and rob a gas station. Make sense? It's true, the concepts of critical juncture and path dependence aren't so easily applied in real life like this. I mean, if you decided to smoke meth and rob a gas station on your 18th birthday, well, there's probably already some prior critical juncture that condition you to make bad decisions in general. Maybe there was violence in your household as a child. Maybe your mom kept meth in the medicine cabinet. Well, the point here is that once you're on a clear path, in this case, the path of a drug addict and a felon, almost everything you do for the rest of your life will directly or indirectly reflect that reality. So how do critical junctures and path dependence make it difficult or impossible even for poor countries to escape their past and place? It probably makes most sense to start with a geography thesis. It comes in many forms, to be sure, but perhaps the most eloquent rundown can be found in this book right here, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. Like so many other scholars, he's asking why part of the world is so rich and developed while other parts are so poor and, and underdeveloped. And his answer is more or less the following. Going back thousands of years in time, the characteristics of a region's physical geography, its climate, including specific types of flora and fauna that naturally exist there, either facilitated or conversely impeded the development of large, hierarchically organized societies whose more complex division of labor favored both scientific development and more sophisticated natural resource exploitation. For instance, 10,000 years ago, shortly after the end of the Great Ice Age, the natural existence of easily taxable crops like wheat and barley, in addition to easily domesticated animals like pigs and buffalo in that once wet region we now call Mesopotamia, or present-day Iraq, created perfect conditions for the Great Agricultural Revolution, or at least one of them which itself created the conditions for the development of one of the first politically sophisticated, hierarchically stratified empires in which a class of intellectuals and civil servants dedicated themselves to science and the written language, while a class of slaves toiled in the fields and in the mines. And the result of all this? Well, you got population growth on one hand, which is important, but perhaps more significantly, you got the Bronze Age, and then later the Iron Age, and then later on the Age of Catapults, and then cannons, and then seafaring boats that could transport a class of professional soldiers across entire oceans to go terrify people who had never heard the blast of an arquebus. Get fire! Or seen the crazed eyes of a giant white horse. <laughs> Well, that's right. And so it was that a critical juncture unleashed by a bunch of melting ice some 10,000 years ago set in motion a series of developments that would ultimately give Europeans, to whom much of Mesopotamia's technological savvy had transferred, a clear advantage over much of the rest of the world's population when, around the year 1500, Portuguese and Spanish ships started circumventing the globe for the first time. And this moment, more or less the year 1500, as you already know, naturally became a major critical juncture in and of itself, as it marked the beginnings of a whole new world order in which political and economic institutions imposed on much of the global south would be designed quite specifically to serve the needs and wants of the global north. Bam! That sounds like a segue. But wait, we're still talking about path dependence, just so you know. Don't forget it. Here's the thing. 
you'll notice as you read chapter nine in our textbook that there's a lot of talk about the high levels of economic informality in poor countries, specifically as a cause of underdevelopment. And this is all very true. So let's pursue this subject for just a minute. Take money lending for, for example. Here in Brazil, where I'm currently living, most poor people simply can't get formal bank loans. Maybe because they don't have a bank account, maybe because they don't have proof of income because they run an unregistered cash business, or maybe they're illiterate and, and that sucks. Or maybe it's because banks are just not part of their social universe. Whatever the case, it is really, really common for people here to borrow money in the informal market directly from private lenders called agiotas. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that it's illegal. So two things happen. First, the risk of non-payment is high and so interest rates are also really, really high. And second, because it is illegal, agiotas, money lenders, also must have their own thugs to deal with the people who don't pay. And this is one of the reasons why 60,000 people are murdered in Brazil every year. Incidentally, being, on, being an agiota is also a very dangerous profession because killing an illegal moneylender is a pretty effective way to erase one's debt. Typically in developing countries, somewhere between 40 and 80% of all economic activity will be in the informal sector. And this applies to everything from financial markets like money lending schemes I just spoke about, but also to the labor market, that is people who are working under the table, as we say, into the property, into the business markets. For example, in slums, people generally must purchase land, they must pay rent on properties and pay some form of tax on whatever business they run, but they generally aren't registering these transactions with the state. And likewise, they, they aren't being guaranteed any of the protections supposedly provided by the state regarding workers' rights, homeowners' rights, renters' rights, etc. And all this informality, well, in some ways it's okay. Right? Because from one perspective, it ends up acting as a sort of safety net for the poor. And to be honest, people who grew up in the informal world, well, they tend to like it that way. I mean, think about all those little part-time jobs that some of you do from time to time to make an extra buck. Jobs like babysitting my little Emma Rose or mowing Mr. Bradshaw's big green lawn. Well, now that would seem like a very big, unnecessary hassle to go register that kind of employment with the state, wouldn't it? I mean, you'd have to pay taxes on that money after all. On the other hand, the long-term costs of informality, both to the poor and to society as a whole, are pretty high and therefore they create by themselves a sort of barrier to economic development. How? Well, with informal loans, you pay higher interest rates. With informal employment, you are out of luck when you get hurt on the job. And with informal commerce, you pay a lot in bribes to the port authority. With informal property rights, you build your little brick home on a really steep slope and when it rains pretty hard, well, you get the point. And all the while, with the informal sector, the state isn't collecting tax revenue, which means that it will have less money to invest in other things that are really important for economic growth, like health, education, and infrastructure. But remember, we're still talking about path dependence. How? Well, you see, a lot of development theorists out there, especially those who call themselves new institutionalists, have this idea that if we go to a country like, say, Bolivia, where 75% of all economic activity is in the informal sector, and there we simply change some laws and reform some government bureaucracies, in essence, alter the formal rules of engagement in the economy so that we can fundamentally change people's behavior. Well, people are going to change their behavior in ways that are more conducive to growth. For example, in much of the developing world, registering a legal business is such a long, drawn out and expensive process that really only very big companies do it at all. So maybe if we just streamline these regulatory agencies and remove all the red tape, well then the small business owners will be more than happy to join the formal economy. Personally, I think the argument of the new institutionalist is very logical and very good in general, but forgive me, it lacks a grasp of how important path dependence is. You see, the exclusive, corrupt, and bureaucratically unwieldy formal institutions of developing countries were created that way in the first place, not haphazardly, but because in this way and form, they serve the interest of a small elite 
whose wealth and privilege depend on the denial of wealth and privilege to the vast majority of their countrymen. For example, here in Brazil, as really in many other developing countries, there's a common saying in politics. It goes something like this. For my friends, everything. For my enemies, there is the law. The point is, in what is now the post-colonial world, a world that was birthed in a fire and flame around the year 1500 when Portuguese and Spanish ships started circumventing the globe for the first time, well, formal political and economic institutions, institutions were never intended to be truly inclusive. Much to the contrary, their purpose was to preserve the status and privilege of an elite few. And that's why there is so much red tape in the Ministry of Commerce, so much so that no one in their right mind would formally register their taco stand. And that is why it is not easy at all to just tweak the formal rules of the game. Even if people's economic behavior suddenly embraced formality, if you did, which I don't expect that they actually would, but you can't just change the formal rules because you still, to this day, have a small class of elites that will do everything in their power to block those changes. Because their privilege and their status depends on it. That's path dependence. But what do you think? I'm Professor Michael Wolf, and this is the Politics of Development Online. If you catch me at the border, I got visas in my name. If you come around here, 